Hello there. I have a few different things today. Some words from Don Juan for Nagual. I had a revelation, a sudden shock. I could see that we live in the remnants of civilization. I was always confused by the idea of morality, you know, these lists of the good things that you should do and the bad things that you should not do. I mean, they're okay, but how could that be the essence of a civilization? What was really meant by it? There are many things in our culture, certainly in religion, that you have to ask yourself, what is really meant by this? And the morality was one thing. But with a shock, I realized what it meant. Morality is not a list of things that you're meant to follow. What morality means is that the state of an ordinary man he can distinguish good from bad from the inside without any rules. He's in touch with reality because he cares about reality. His conscience functions and he can tell literally from the inside what is right and what is wrong. He doesn't need to ask anybody. Now perhaps back then, thousands of years ago must be, Maybe even before the flood. Back then, somebody would say, well, if you can tell the difference between this good thing and that bad thing, then you're in the right state. That's what morality must have originally meant. But today, we only have the relics. People don't understand what it means. People think that they list the things you have to follow. They no longer recognize the two states because there are so few people on this planet who live in the state of a real man. And everything has to be understood like that. Everything that you see in the culture, everything that you have been taught and heard about is coming from the people who are a remnant of a once great or once knowledgeable people thousands of years ago and these people cannot understand they cannot understand because the law of three does not function in them so they live only as a tool for the planetary forces they don't live for themselves they haven't got their own ability to think or to understand things they're simply mechanical now, I was sitting in a garden today, looking at trees, and there were some kids running around, and birds, and so on. These are all created, aren't they? They all do something, and when they're slain, they release something. The Earth is a giant being. In the sequence of creation, there's the Sun Absolute, then all the stars in the universe and then following that the planets and these planets create things they create life and we are that life we are very very small I ask myself some very serious questions sometimes for instance why is there no help and even if I get help I've asked for help so many times praying to Jesus or God or somebody, did I get any help? Sometimes I got the sense of a presence or witnessing or even encouragement or a sense of some stardust, but nobody ever told me anything. And on this planet you can quite easily die by asking people questions. Eventually the answers are so painful to hear that you something inside you dies because it's all just lies and unconsciousness. 
and you start to think that there's nothing real in this world. And then you stumble over Gurdjieff's pyramid, his book, you fall over it, or another teacher, and you realize not only is there light, but there is a man who once knew it. Most spirituality is just believe in God, but Gurdjieff had details because he was a magician, basically. He studied magic, which means the transformation and usage of subtle materials. It's a particular type of intelligence that's quite unusual. There are types of intelligence you can develop, for instance, the ability to witness things, the ability to visualize it, to have intuition. These are all different eyes, if you like. Different ways your intelligence can be cultivated. They probably function from different regions of the forehead. But Gurdjieff's intelligence, which is close to the hermetic or magical intelligence, is very, very, very subtle, very subtle. It's like a, a razor blade through which this kind of knowledge comes through. Most yogis don't have any of this kind of knowledge. If you look at uh, the Chinese arts, mostly they're just uh, copied from the teacher and they make a big deal about it, the lineage and the being close to your master. Never, I think, has such a vast tome of subtle knowledge been stuck in a book and sold in the marketplace. And it doesn't really matter, since from listening to so many students, who's really getting it? Nobody. You don't really have to hide things. Now I happened to see um, a very interesting movie called Seven Years in Tibet. It was made in about 1956 and it had footage of Tibet when the Dalai Lama was still there. I think it was filmed about five years before the Chinese forced the Tibetans to flee and they went over the mountains and now they live in northern India. And there is footage of Tibet with all their hats and their unusual Buddhism and their Bon culture and their trumpets and their wares. The whole culture, it's all on black and white film. Go and, go and see it, it's on YouTube. Amazing footage. But if Tibet can die, if Tibet can die, and recently, if the entire Tibetan culture can be crushed like that, why can't we? Why can't the entire species? This planet is hellishly unstable. If the wind is blowing in the wrong way, things that are created over centuries are just destroyed overnight. Why? Why? If I pray to God, why aren't I helped and lifted up to the sky? Well, there's some sense of collective punishment. We're just too small, I guess. We are too small. So we have to struggle, like salmon. And if you read the lives of saints, yeah, they struggle. But such struggling is unknown in the West now. We live in a, a bum culture, excuse me, a culture of people who just don't even know what it means to make an effort, let alone a spiritual effort. They don't even know the question anymore. I think the future is not good. Sorry. But yet, we do have time, so let's do something. Uh, these are a selection of quotes from Don Juan, the Nagual. And he sees life, clearly he sees life. I don't understand much about his path, but I understand that he sees. 
He says, The eagle devours the awareness of all the creatures that are alive on earth a moment before and now dead, have floated to the eagle's beak like a swarm of fireflies to meet their owner, their reason for having had a life. The eagle disentangles these tiny flames, lays them flat as a tanner stretches out a hide, and then consumes them, for awareness is the eagle's food. Because the eagle is the central intelligence, the central life, and he wishes to exist, just like you do. Don't you wish to exist and protect your house, look after your health? You're forced to work, aren't you? And the eagle works. He creates children and gardens and planets because he wishes to exist. He's working just like we have to work. And he is rewarded just as we are. I'll continue. Every living thing has been granted the power, if it so desires, to seek an opening to freedom and go through it. It is evident to the seer who sees the opening, and to the creatures that go through it, that the eagle has granted that gift in order to perpetuate awareness. The possibility of self-realization exists also for the eagle's purposes. If you want to grow grass, on a plane, you don't have to do much. But if you want more, if you want trees in the forest and even culture in cities, who's going to run them? The grass pretty much runs itself. But if you want more complicated things, if you want power, if you want to create a dynamic world, then you do need people and you need to give them some power. And self-realization is when the eagle gives you some of its power. Where does the power come from? The angels were given a certain kind of power, but they are boring. They are boring because as they were created by the eagle, directly according to a plan, they pretty much just do what they are told. And so they cannot create much. They are not very interesting. And it limits the creation of the entire universe. Whereas a human being being the smallest similitude of the whole, meaning the smallest body in the universe that can become self-realized, the smallest. It also means that we are closest to the earth, to the underworld, to the subtle world. So that's where the real juice is, deep in the earth, in the underworld. The vicious power that is underneath comes from, and we are close to that. And that power, if it can be channeled into the light, truly becomes powerful. Jesus was like that. It's like taking all the monsters and all their power and transforming them into light. Surely that is a very difficult job. But then you, you gain the power of these creatures the power of the primordial darkness. He says, A warrior can no longer weep, and his only expression of anguish is a shiver that comes from the very depths of the universe. It is as if one of the eagle's emanations were made out of pure anguish, and when it hits the warrior, the warrior's shiver is infinite. Warriors have only one thing in mind, their freedom. To die and be eaten by the eagle is no challenge. On the other hand, to sneak around the eagle and be free is the ultimate audacity. Probably we need nine parts kneeling, surrendering, bowing. But one part has to be kept open. We need the primordial lust for existence. You must wish to be. The spirituality we see on the planet is quite sterile and meek, isn't it? But that has to be seen in the right way. 
as a case of reciprocal maintenance to those who are ahead of us and superior to us and feed us, we must work that nourishment just as they have done before us. We must be truly grateful for our daily bread. That is only natural and sincere. The sincerity is just sincerity. It's not about being a good person, it's just sincere to see how it is, to see how it is and be aligned with what is true. There is a long journey and I have been tortured to grow up in a, in a way that I not necessarily wanted to or could understand. And um, yeah, last week I was um, sitting in that same garden feeling quite despondent and wondering how to live in a world where people are so childish and seem so disinterested in higher matters. And I went to unchain my bike and I was leaning over it and I looked up and there was um, like a fairy in front of me. It was a, a woman and she was dressed up in a, a kind of um, shimmering ball gown and she had a tiara on and lots of makeup. She said that she was at a children's party and that she was an entertainer and she does a bit of magic and I said she looked wonderful and wished her well. You know, and I, I took that as a message because I think we're given messages all the time if we want to hear. And the message was from the earth and the earth was saying these people are childish but help them and love them and do what you can for them and soothe their sorrow give them love however they can understand it because what else can you do I mean being angry or unhappy with what people do it's just somewhat meaningless the fact is is that most people cannot follow you if you're a seeker but it doesn't mean you cannot help them in the sense of being warm towards them. Isn't that worth something? In the end, the gaping mouth of the grave is waiting for all of these people, for all of us. Who has time to even contemplate these things? He says, When warriors talk about time, they are not referring to something which is measured by the movement of a clock. Time is the essence of attention. The eagle's emanations are made out of time. And properly speaking, when a warrior enters into other aspects of the self, he is becoming acquainted with time. Some people have said that religion is about time stopping. It is not about time stopping. There is no such thing as time stopping. It's just dumb. Intelligence requires a sequential processing, otherwise there wouldn't be anything. But, um, but if you enter a higher state, it can feel very different and you feel relieved of all the human struggles. So you think you live in a timeless place, but you don't. You just live in a place you're not acquainted to and pretty soon you start to notice characteristics at least if you've got your eyes open and furthermore that kind of attitude comes from people who are trying to trick their way across the line which doesn't work anybody who's doing any real serious spiritual practice knows that you don't get something for nothing and that there is a path and a road and uh, sort of sequential steps. There are sequential steps, and yet there is also, you know, making a jump into new identity or a new place. Both those things are the same. In the same way, there is a map, diagrams of the inner bodies and so on. And then when you experience them, you experience them as a living presence. Both those things are together. You cannot get far without the map. So those people who think, oh, what? I don't need a teacher, I don't need any instruction, it doesn't work. 
an intelligent person should seek instruction and he should have the instruction and then by practicing it he has the results the inexperience so you have two things you see <laughs> people find that confusing my god Okay, let's turn to Gurdjieff now. He says, General laws are by no means all obligatory for man. He can free himself from many of them if he frees himself from buffness and from imagination. All this is connected with the liberation from personality. Personality feeds on imagination and falsehood. If the falsehood in which man lives is decreased and imagination is decreased, personality very soon weakens and a man begins to be controlled either by fate or by a line of work which is in its turn controlled by another man's will. This will lead him until a will of his own has been formed, capable of withstanding both accident and, when necessary, fate. Well, I think he describes very nicely here why you need a teacher. The important thing here is that a man who is a teacher can draw a straight line because he has transformed himself by his own teacher and by directing you again and again and again and again and again you follow a straight line and the particular aspects of your development yeah, you could come from any side, Western, Eastern, emotional, physical, psychological. But the point is that you work in a line and he is working you along a line. That's why you need a teacher. I have had um, several teachers, each one for many years. And my teacher now, I don't think I'll ever leave him been maybe a dozen years I can't even remember doesn't really make any difference there's no one else even close to him but for a while I followed Osho and I read all his books and I did many of his practices I immersed myself and I just continued and continued and continued and I drowned and I was grateful to drown but I guess that says something about me Another revelation that has been coming for some time is that life, in fact, is a meritocracy. And you get from nature exactly what you deserve. And I think that's true. Now, for instance, um, some time back, um, I was doing a lot of hard work and straining myself, not approaching it in a good way, and I became very stressed and let off some steam, shall we say. Immediately I was punished. Next day, things started falling apart. I could just feel it, I could feel it. I could draw a straight line from my misdeeds the previous week to all these things that were collapsing in front of me. So I got to work. I accepted my punishment. And I got to work fixing them. Best as I could. Gurdjieff says, and I think it's very true, that the most important thing that a parent can teach you is to accept punishment for your misdeeds, and that's something that I did get from my family. May the Lord make us truly sorry when we should be. What's the point of struggling with the world? What's the point of struggling with the world or the people? There's no point. You get exactly what you deserve. Nothing much is going to change. If you push this over, something else is going to take its place. Because you get what you deserve. The only way to change that is to deserve something different. Mostly I think that's about um, emanating a different kind of energy. You know, you can put on a big smile and smile at everybody, but that's rather superficial. The changes have to go deep inside. They need techniques, they need work, 
they need thousands of hours of work or listening to stuff on YouTube, you know. So for people in the West who maybe never did any real spiritual work, you're screwed. I would just suggest that you, um, you know, go to a yogic center, go and do a workshop, go and do an evening, you know. Do Sometimes they have day workshops, you know. A morning, three hours, four hours, 20 pounds, 50 pounds. Just go and do something, you know, feel something. Learn something because the people in the West today, they just have got no idea what spirituality is about anymore, nor how to practice. And it's all going down. In the past, in the Middle Ages and so on, you know, people would go to church every day of the week. They pray from morning to night. They had little books. You believe that? Those were the ancestors of the Western people. All forgotten, isn't it? People trouble me, but to what extent is it worth trying to change things here? If I were to improve something on the left, then something on the right probably going to break. Because I don't deserve it, you know? That's why the work of inner transformation, union with God, surrender to God, healing, fixing, learning, transmuting, those are the things that actually change your substance. Then you will deserve more. Because you can give more. Most people try to give more by getting busy or talking something smiling but it's still coming from the same inner mess inner turmoil nature sees your inner turmoil and receives that as a emanation the result of spiritual practice and inner unification is that you emanate differently oh yes in terms of the thought is indeed very interesting but it comes from below, once you integrate the emotional system and your body is in a better situation, then your thinking is much better. It works in, in layers. Directly underneath thought is feelings. And uh, the personality, characters, many eyes and all that. The more of that you can heal, the better you're, you can think. Because it's all part of the same tower. You're, you're a tower of different functioning. Maybe thought is at the top of an ordinary man. Directly underneath it is the feeling system. And um, the many eyes are part of the feeling system that have uh, personal characteristics. Something like that. Yeah, and so the many eyes underneath the many eyes is feelings. So if you can integrate, heal, rectify one layer than the one above it, will function better. You know, so people who are trying to think of an answer, it's not, thinking is an instrument, but it comes from below. It has um, uh, a structure below, and it's more effective to improve your thinking by improving how your feelings work and so on. Which is why, one of the reasons I do the five element chico. Okay, well, I see if I can get a, a nice waterfall picture. I saw one of um, Niagara the other day. Maybe I'll stick that on. And I wish you well. Whoever you are, wherever you are, God be with you.